somebody with a good foundation in one art, I think, will have a much, much easier time understanding other arts. Welcome. You are listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 534, with today's guest, Mr. Matt State. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest place to find the way that we monetize all this. We sell some stuff. We've got a store over there. And if you're willing to support us by making a purchase, you can use the code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15% off everything we've got there. Now, the show itself, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We like to keep our name simple. This show comes out twice each week. And the goal of the show is pretty specific. We're looking to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do as Whistlekick, as this show, you've got a lot of ways you can help us out. Here are a few of them. You could make a purchase, as I mentioned. You could share an episode, maybe on your Facebook page. You could follow us on social media. Our handles are at Whistlekick everywhere. You could tell a friend about us. I bet you've got some people you train with who probably don't know about us yet. Help them out. You could also pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave a review on your podcast app. Or you could support the Patreon. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick. That's the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. And at each tier, we give you more exclusive content. We put stuff on Patreon we do not put anywhere else. If you're willing to help us out with a few bucks, we're willing to give you even more good stuff. The root of all the guests we bring on Martial Arts Radio, it's traditional martial arts. Our guests have some tie. Almost all of them have trained in some form of traditional martial arts. And today's guest is no exception. We have a great conversation about not only where he started and where he's at, but his perspective, his unique view on the world. And it's a view that I suspect is going to resonate quite a bit with this audience. We talk about a lot of great things, and instead of ruining any of them, as you know I hate to do in the intros, I'll just... We'll let it unfold for you as you listen. So enjoy. Hey there, Matt. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you on. And you're coming from afar, aren't you? You're. We, we've got a good body of water in between us, don't we? Yeah, that's right. I'm based in. Uh, I'm based in the UK in in Wales. So for anyone that uh, knows where that is, it basically rains a lot, but it's very beautiful. Right. But you don't. Correct me if I'm wrong. You don't have a Welsh accent. No, that's right. No, I've spent most of my life living in England. So, but I'm, but I was born in Wales, and and I've made, I found my way home. Okay. Do do you consider yourself Welsh? Because you may be our first Welsh guest. Oh, when the rugby's on, and when I'm badly singing, <laughs> when I'm cooking, then yes. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. And we're here to talk about you. We're here to hear your stories and the things that you've seen and done as a martial artist. And let's start in the most important and sometimes the most exciting place, the beginning. You know, what's, what's your martial arts origin story? Well, I don't tend to dwell on it too much these days because it's, it's sort of already out there in the, in the world. But uh, essentially, I didn't have the best start in life. It was quite a difficult upbringing. There was violence in the home and all around. We moved around a lot. My father committed suicide. So, um, so yeah, so not a great start. But, um, but throughout all of that, I was very, very keen on martial arts. Back in those days, there was very few things. There was a few series on the television. There was obviously Bruce Lee was coming to the fore. Um, there were some bits in the wrestling. So people like Iron Fist and wrestlers like that. But but there wasn't anything like there is now. But those glimpses of that gave me this appetite, if you will, to want to figure it out, understand it and learn it. Now, we we don't have to dig you know, you, you, you laid some things out there, right there, stuff that's kind of heavy. And maybe we'll get into some of it as we go. But what I'm hearing is almost a contrast. You know, violence, pain, challenge. And then on the other side of it, these martial arts figures who tend to campaign against that to, to represent, you know, we can call it light and dark, I guess, if we, if we want to be that fundamental about it. Is that how you see it? 
Well, um, I, I suppose if I was going to break it down to its essence, when you when you look at martial arts movies, when you look at you know heroes in the story, they 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 don't seem to have any fear and they beat all the bad guys. And when you're a young person that is in fear constantly from the the world around you with no real way out of it then that's a very enticing proposition and so um and so yeah so that was something that i looked at i mean i was a big fan at the time of tarzan and spider-man and a few you know sort of heroes like that but the truth was i was very aware that you know i wasn't going to get adopted by a band of gorillas or bitten by a radioactive spider so my best my best chance if you like was actually martial arts and so the, the theory was that one day I would become sort of invincible and frightened of nothing and, and I would be the hero in the movie. Unfortunately, that didn't entirely come to pass, but, uh, but it started me off. So you start off with the admiration for training. And when did you cross that threshold? When did you actually start? Oh, yeah, I had a few false starts as a as a youngster. So um, we tried one or two things that didn't entirely work out. I mean, I did I did actually write a book um, in and around all of these kind of stories because I, I tried. Um, I had a little go at judo because, like with a lot of people, when you're that age in the in the sort of um, early eighties and late seventies. There, there wasn't really a lot about. So boxing and judo was were, were two of the ones that were about. So I tried judo and um, that didn't entirely work out in my favour because we ended up buying a um, a second hand gi, a uniform, because that was that was all that uh, my mum could afford at the time. Now, unfortunately, it came with an orange belt, and uh, and I was uh, I wasn't even a white belt. I trained for a couple of weeks at this point. And unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to do the jacket up without it. So I wore the belt and got shouted at for it and ended up ended up being so embarrassed that I left and never went back. Mm. That's a that's a painful experience. That's I, it's, I, I, it's, it's, it's interesting ahead. because yeah. um, obviously now I'm looking at it from the other side of the coin and um, and it's one of those where I, 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 f- I fully, fully understand that his take on that the instructor at the time his take on that was that i hadn't earned that grade or rank and i shouldn't be wearing it however as i said uh, through innocence and and not understanding i didn't i didn't realize the concept of that and i and i generally couldn't figure out how to keep the jacket closed without it so, right, <laughs> so that because there issue. isn't a way there, there's there's no way on a judogi no but that's right i mean it's one of those isn't it where you're you're sort of met with this uh, back in those days as well. They were also ferocious looking. I mean, when you're a, you know, when you're a small sort of kid um, looking up to the, the sort of black belt instructors and sensei, they were, they were also dour and ferocious. And, um, and then at the time that the persona was not somebody that you could, you know, ask questions for, it was all very much, you know, don't say anything and sit over there and wait until you're told sort of thing. Yeah. So that was the, that was the vibe. Yeah. And, and that was pretty common of the time. I mean, I, I can't mm. speak, speak to training in the UK at that time, but, you know, I started training here in the US in the early 80s and it was very much a, okay, if, if we're going to teach kids, we're going to pretend they're small adults and, and hold them to standards that maybe weren't always appropriate for kids. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but that was the, um, you know, sort of that was the time and that was what was there. So that was my, if you like, one of my first... Uh, forays into real martial arts, which didn't entirely go to plan. But, uh, but I, you know, I've, I've, I, I touch back into that later on. I mean, I've got a great love for Japanese arts overall. And I, I did sort of find my way uh, back into some of these things in later life. And so I've got a lot more, um, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of that my first entrance isn't the only thing that I look back on. And where did you go from there? So false start with judo. What was next? Yeah, well then I then I went into some boxing and tried that, and that again was a uh, was was an interesting thing. Uh, learned an awful lot. Uh, so, boxing here it's very grassroots and it's very working class, and so you've got the what they call the spit and sawdust places. So lots of old posters on the wall, very cramped. Um, so, ended up doing some of that, and again it was one of those where I was. I was a bit upset because nobody was kicking anybody. It didn't look like it did on the television. And, and to top it all, people used to shout at me and make me run at like six o'clock in the morning, which was totally against my nature. Um, so that, that, that was something that, um, 
that I wasn't very very keen on. I, I loved the training, the physicality of it, but I didn't like the uh, the road work and all of that. And then I actually did um, I actually did uh, about as a child and. I, I remember that really vividly because again, back then the world was a different place. And so I remember it was in a, a working men's club and all around were, 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 were sort of middle-aged middle um, sort of rather portly gentlemen all smoking cigars. And there was a huge amount of cigarette smoke in the room and it was, it was pretty sordid. And, and I do remember them shouting at the little kids and they were shouting, um, you know, not particularly helpful things. You know, so things like, you know f him up and damage him and you know hit him again and all that kind of stuff which is a uh, when you've got children competing it wasn't a very nice atmosphere mm. but as i said that was a long time ago the world's different now it is all right so judo's not your thing boxing's not resonating the way that maybe you'd hoped it would where do you go from there yeah, well, as I would say, that was as a child. So, I mean, I've got a great love for both of those arts. And so that's not, um, it's, 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 <laughs> it was just my first experience. Um, but, but essentially, nobody was kicking anybody. And I was seeing that on the television and thinking, that's, you know, that's kind of where I want to be. I want to do that. Um, obviously, Bruce Lee was, was sent to stage at the time. And, and, and that was kind of where I wanted to sort of be and what I wanted to emulate. So, uh, unfortunately, I took a back seat then for a little while because life sort of took over. And um, and then I then I found karate really, which was my home for a very long time. That was uh, that was a very lucky a lucky introduction because I had no idea of the quality that I'd found and the um, and the and the level of teaching that I was exposed to. I just sort of stumbled across it, and uh, and, and yeah, it turns out that uh, that it was a it was a fantastic foundation. It was a fantastic place to learn, and uh, and I and I've got nothing but respect for these guys you know for for what they gave me did you know that karate was going to work for you when you when you started did it was the addition of the kicks what you needed well it was the whole thing i mean straight away and, and again it's one of those where to this day the, that particular memory of walking through those doors is is very very clear in my mind and and it was and i describe it as like a like actually stepping into a movie set it was um, I was greeted at the door by by a green belt called Chris, a big, big guy with a bald head, and he was sweating. He was in the middle of a training session. And, and he was the, the guy that opened the door to me and then actually became my senpai for quite some time after that, a really lovely guy. And um, I was ushered in, and there were rows of, 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 uh, of karate cut on the mats performing techniques. Um, so they were running through some of the punches. And obviously, they're all dressed in their geese. The, the, the training hall itself, the dojo, was a traditional dojo. It had a very certain smell to it that anybody's trained in that environment will remember. Um, and all of those things came together, and it was just... It was just like stepping into that movie. It was like, it was actually suddenly real for me. So that was, that was instantly, there was this affinity with it that, that I didn't necessarily find before. Now, you mentioned the quality of instruction. That then it requires some some hindsight to tell, tell us a bit about your instructor in the environment uh, well as i said it's one of those where i i had no idea really of the quality that i was sort of uh, in and around initially it was one of those where i was very fortunate that that one of my instructors he, he actually gained his first black belt the year that i was born now now that was quite some time ago um so 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 there was an awful lot of knowledge there and they'd been training for a very long time and um and and they were at a very very good level and it's the foundations i think that's really critical and something that I, I can't really stress enough the value that that has, that has brought to me because obviously I've gone on and I've done many, many other things over many years, but that foundation, that base, that, le that, that, that very, very solid understanding of principles and body mechanics and everything else that they gifted to me, it has allowed everything else to sit on top of it. So, um, so yeah, forever grateful for that. And, and you open the door. We're, we're going on to other things. So, karate and where where are you headed from there well the, the, then it sort of became a, a bit a bit of a, a mismatch journey then so i went off into um, other things so we, we did various 
various other things like sort of full contact kickboxing sort of went into that um, did some grappling stuff i mean this was this was before sort of mma was really a big thing um and also started working in security and that was probably the biggest change in the way that i looked at the world because i started working as a as a bouncer uh, in security doing various things where it wasn't any longer theory based it was very much there was a consequence to an action so you know no longer was it well this might work and we can theorize we can chat about it in the pub we can discuss it it was it was a very very clear this either does or it doesn't because if it does you go home safe if it doesn't somebody gets hurt it really was that clear cut we've had a number of guests on who have spent some time working security and for quite a few of them it was a pivotal time it was either they realized that what they were doing was working and they kind of honed in on more specifically uh, certain aspects of what they were doing. And for others, they found, wow, this is not at all what I would have expected. I feel like quite a bit of my time has been wasted. How did that step into security change your perspective or reinforce it? Well, it was interesting because... um... It did. It did flag up an awful lot of questions, which of course it would. And I had to. I had to really revisit myself and what I believed up to that point, because again, it's 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 usually quite a revelation when people actually step out of a training competition environment into something like that, because. Well, it is. It's different. The environment's different. The landscape is different. The, um, the everything's different. So, so yeah, I had to really have some conversations with myself. And some of the things that I needed to look at was the way that I trained, and that became really an issue because it became apparent that the training has to suit the environment. So, when you're in a position where it, you you have to deal with with multiple people, weapons you know, communication, um, all kinds of things in and around all of that, then <clears throat> you have to you have to train accordingly. So that was something I had to look at. And then I had to start questioning really, and I did question a lot whether the martial arts I'd been learning up to that point was actually effective. And what I've sort of come to the conclusion on that is that the truth is it was um it it it, it wasn't so much the technique but the platform. So the way that I explain that now in my teaching is, is, is I say to somebody that when you think about the environment that you're in, it's not competition range. The rules aren't there. The mindset is different. And so the platform that you use has to reflect that. So if I'm in a competition, then I'll be in a competition style, mental state and fighting stance. If I'm going to do, say, two-step sparring, or Carter or something like that, again, that will reflect that. But if I'm in a situation where, you know, it's, it's, it's an outside environment and the consequences are pretty far reaching, then my mindset is going to be different. My approach is going to be different. And, um, and so all of those things had to be factored in. So yeah, long story short, I, I wrestled with that for a while and I thought, well, it can't, I've, you know, I, I, I've clearly admit that I'm not the best person in the world physically. And so I'm not saying because I can't make it work, somebody else can't. And that was something I wrestled with originally because I did, th- I did for a while think, oh, this is all rubbish. This is all pointless. What on earth have I done? Wasted my time. And it took a while for me to sort of get around the fact that actually the, the concepts were good. The techniques were good. The understanding of it was good. What was, what was not good was the platform. And that's what had to change. And once I sort of realized that, then everything sort of fitted into place a lot better for me. I can see that. And I, I can relate to that a bit too. I would imagine through some of this, as you're, you're having some of these epiphanies, you're probably doing some, some additional training, maybe some training on your own, maybe some other people involved in security. Most of us know, I mean, even all of us know what a formal karate or judo or boxing class might look like. But, what did your training and your, I don't know, maybe research is the right word as you, as you start unpacking some of this stuff, what did that look like as you're going through this time? 
Oh, an awful lot of that was was um, trial by combat, for want of a better word. So I, you know, I test out a load of different clubs, a lot of different styles. I would actively go and participate, and and more often than not, get absolutely uh, battered, where my ego would take a very severe bruising. But it was, but it was all all relative, and all uh, and it had it had a a point to it because. Um, like I said, as a foundation, it was fantastic, but but nothing has all of the answers. And so then it was an exploratory journey then with regards to, I mean, I, 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 I delved heavily into Krav Maga and Kapap, Israeli military systems. Um, I delved into MMA and catch wrestling and um, jiu-jitsu and all, all kinds of other things as well. Obviously, the full contact stuff I got more into as well. So, um, so I went off on these adventures for want of a better word and tried different things because I wanted to test the parameters of what I knew plug the gaps as well was really really important because the gaps were there there was a lot of things I didn't know about not just physically but um, when it comes to confrontation as I'm sure you're aware there's a lot more to it than just a physical action i.e., a punch or a kick and so all that had to be understood as well. So it was a real, a real sort of journey of learning. And as I said, for the most part, my ego got pushed around quite a lot at that point. I mean, I remember going to, uh, I went to an Olympic wrestling class for a few months. Now, I don't know if anybody knows anything about Olympic wrestling, but these guys are just absolute monsters and just, just incredibly strong, incredibly powerful, stamina like you wouldn't believe. I mean, the warm-ups would kill me. And, and they'd just be grinning at me and then throw me around for an hour. And I'm not a small guy, you know, I'm, <laughs> that's the, but it was, it, was a, it was a great opportunity for me to be able to say, look, I don't know everything. I'm here to learn. And, and when I went to places with that attitude, um, everyone was really open and friendly. I mean, I didn't, they didn't take it easy on me, but they did it with a smile. <laughs> yeah, I, I have done a bit of training with wrestlers. And I have to say, in terms of overall, just broad-based physical ability, I would say they are second only to gymnasts. Mind-blowing, the strength and control and endurance that they have. Absolutely agreed, yeah. This, the, 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 that, that was it, the stamina, the speed, the, the strength, all of those things all rolled into one package. And, um, and yeah, as a you know, as a, as a, as a, as an art form, as a, a martial art, as a sport, however you want to call it, it's definitely up there in the top. Now, I, I forget the word you used. Did you, did you refer to them as gaps? Some, some things that you were working through things that you had yeah. to identify and resolve. Can, can you give yeah. us some examples? Yeah, certainly. So um, an obvious example would be back then would be the, the ground game would be, having an understanding of, of grappling on the floor. So, um, I mean, you can, you can look at it and be, and be a little bit sort of argumentative and combative and say, well, now all of a sudden, everybody's found these hidden meanings in their carter and things, and the ground was there all along. Um, so some people have taken that tact. Other people have gone and said, well, actually what we've done is we've, we've figured out that we're perhaps lacking a little bit in that part of our development. So let's look elsewhere to plug those gaps. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it was one of those where I, I, I was an early adopter, if you like, we're well, not an early adopter, it's been going on for a long time, but, but very early on, I realized that, that, that I had to add other things into what I already did to fill those gaps. And so that's where then the wrestling, the catch, that kind of stuff, came more to the fore because I wanted to understand the ground game a bit more and also stand up grappling as well, you know, throws, takedowns, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then another, another very clear gap that came to me very early on was the actual understanding of the physiology of what happens, the human brain in communication and the, the very real effects that that has on a person during conflict um, and again, that was something that we'd never really gone gone over um, up until that point. I had to start really looking for it. There was two um, two main points that really stand out that that that, that show these and highlight these points. One was um, my very first karate competition as a green belt. My hands were shaking that much. My sensei had to do my belt up for me, 
Um, I couldn't even do my own belt up that I'd been doing for all that time I'd been training. But be because I was so ramped up, and I thought I was afraid. I thought I was a coward. I thought, you know, I must be, I, I must be a coward because my hands are shaking. And it turns out that wasn't the case at all. That was just part of the deal. But I didn't know that then. And so that was something that stays in my mind. And then secondly, was a guy called Jeff Thompson, who I'm sure most of your listeners may have heard of. He's um, the guy over here in the UK that just absolutely um, rewrote the martial arts scene in the, in the early 90s with with his uh, not just realistic approach but the way that he explained it so it became understandable to the masses i'm not familiar with that name could you tell us a little bit about him and a bit more yeah, of the sure. impact he had on you yeah jeff jeff thompson uh was 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 a practicing martial artist and uh he was a shotokan instructor i believe for a long time as well uh but he started working the doors in a place called coventry many many years ago and he related those stories in a book called watch my back which was a hugely influential book in the very early 90s when it came out but he was one of the first people to start talking about things like you know the fight or flight in a way that people understood adrenaline how that affected you the realities of what you actually can and can't do with regards to technique, fine motor movement, all that sort of thing. Um, and so it was the first time that I'd heard these things articulated in a way that made sense. But also, it wasn't, there wasn't any cover up, there wasn't any pretense that that wasn't in the world. He was very, very honest and said, look, I'm, I'm scared. When these things happen, I am scared. Um, and so that was a real eye opener. And then also on top of that, he's, he's a guy that was working in a factory at the time and, you know, wrote a best-selling book and has now written, well, many, many, many. Um, he's had films made, he's traveled the world, he's an extraordinary individual, um, impacted me in a lot of ways, including my own writing and things. So yeah, if, if people haven't heard of him, he, you know, it may have been the early 90s when he first came out, but trust me, it's still as relative today as it ever was. I'll have to check out, find that book, maybe, maybe find him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, like I be recommend it entirely. Mm. Now, as you're going through and, and filling in these gaps, in, in my mind, it's I see martial arts as kind of like a puzzle. You know, we, we add these pieces from all these different aspects of our training, these different styles, these different answers as we ask the questions. Do you remember a moment when you started to feel like, okay, I've started to put this stuff together. Maybe that was a, a security detail and something went, wrong but then went right for you or maybe a, a moment in training was there something that happened that you said I, i'm starting to get it well um oddly enough my past that i that i mentioned earlier on actually came to the fore in this because firstly i'm a physical guy so the physicality of it actually came easy i thoroughly enjoyed the hard work i thoroughly enjoyed being pushed to what I was capable of and I and I learned quickly so I had an aptitude if you like for for martial arts um, so that was really really in my favor and something that I'm very grateful for to be honest but then on top of that it turned out that when I started working in security and started having to look at all of these things um, what, what it translated to was I'd actually been training since a very young age because violence and all the things associated with that, you know, uh, reactions under stress, fear management, um, communication and how, 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 that, how that works under aggression and all the rest of it. All of those things, it turns out that I'd actually spent my entire childhood in and around and learning. So I actually had this head start over and above. And again, when I started getting into sort of full contact competition and stuff, that, that sort of came to the fore again because some people were afraid of getting hit. Some people were, were afraid and found that difficult. And, and there was that, that sort of hold back, uh, that hanging back, if you like. Um, whereas I didn't have any of that because I'd gone through it many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. So it actually turned out to be a blessing in, in, in a strange way. And where did you go from there? You know, we haven't really been putting timestamps on these things, but... You know, we're, we're starting to see, not even starting, we're seeing the evolution of you as a martial artist. Where's the next step coming? Um, yeah, well, that was, I suppose, 
that that the, the security of moving into that was uh, a very uh, big milestone and then obviously that led me down the the route of all the different styles including as i say the um crab magaka pat back in the early days when that was very new in the country and it was still very raw um so we're not talking about the sort of bloated bohemoth that it's become now which is a huge marketing thing and and there are some really really high quality guys but then there are others that are shall we say less than uh <laughs> less than could um it, 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 pardon me for saying but it sounds like you have some strong opinions on that I've got strong we don't opinions. have to go there, but it sounds I've like got, I've got strong opinions on most okay. things. <laughs> <laughs> good, um, good. Yeah, I think I, I, I mean, if I'm going to be honest on that, I would say that you know, any organization where it takes a fortnight to become an instructor, maybe you have to look at the level of instruction, and let's just leave that there. Um, <laughs> sure. I, I think that is a fair assessment. <laughs> yeah, but there are you know, that's not to take away, there are some really, really genuinely very very talented people within the Krav Maga world and fortunately there's also um you know the other end of the spectrum as well so it's just being it's just being careful and knowing what you're looking for really so um so yeah so anyway so when I first started into that it was it was very new in the world it was very new here and um it was still the essence of what Krav Maga and Kapat used to stand for so um so it was really sort of relevant to some of the things that I was doing um, and then I actually got into the security training itself. So I ended up training to deliver physical intervention, training and conflict management to the security industry and our, uh, our medical services and so on and so forth like that. So, um, so that added another level again on top of what I was already doing, which was really, really interesting because the first thing I had to do was, was actually gain some teaching qualifications um, and most instructors, myself included, originally, we just learned parrot fashion. And when we became instructors ourselves, we would just teach as our instructor taught. We wouldn't necessarily understand why we did that. And so that became, that became a really interesting point of study for me because there were all those little light bulb moments going off like, oh, okay, now that's why we do it that way. I never really understood. Um, and then on top of that, there was obviously all the legal elements of that and the, and the law and how that related and, uh, and so on and so forth. And that, again, is such an important element towards anybody that teaches kind of anything related to self-defense or street orientated stuff. Because I see an awful lot of that where you've got an instructor teaching somebody how to rip somebody's throat out, poke their eye up their nose and then break off their arms and legs <laughs> all in one fantastic dream of technique. Um, but then there's no mention of the legal consequences of that, which will be, you will go to prison for 15 years and your family will be left alone with nobody to put food on the table. Um, and so there's, that became again, another very big element in, in my understanding of martial arts and self-defense. We've, talk to people. Just about anybody listening is going to hear what you just said about, okay, we've got to consider the legal ramifications. They're going to nod their head. They're going to say, yes, I understand that. But how did we get there? How did we go from martial arts as you know, a, a personal growth and self-defense modality to, okay, when it comes to the self-defense stuff, it's going to be zero to 60. And if somebody tries to take your wallet, we need to murder them. <laughs> Any ideas? Because I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how we got there. Well, if I'm going to be absolutely honest, then I'm going to say that we all love to be the hero in our own story. So if you want to actually learn effective self-defense, and this is me just just being me, by the way. So yeah, please. If, uh, if this is your entitled... episode, you can you be you be <laughs> as much you as you want. I'm I'm here to guide. If somebody doesn't like it, they can turn this off. Okay, so uh, with that being said, I don't have all the answers, but my particular theory is um, we all like to be the hero in our own story. And so if we wanted to learn real sort of skills, then we do that through failure for the, for the most part. And so we fail repeatedly to learn how to get it right. Now, when most of us learn martial arts, myself included, um, we, we actually repeat a pretend success. And so if you think about, you know, pair work, partner work, two-step sparring, all of that sort of stuff, it's what we're actually doing is repeating a prescribed set of motions that leads to our, that leads to our pretend victory at the end of it. And we feel good about ourselves. We have a shower, we go home and life goes on. 
if we were actually really looking to push ourselves to the point where we were mentally and emotionally and physically capable of dealing with, you know, the actual horror of real violence, then we would have to put ourselves through stuff that really, really isn't comfortable. And most people don't want to do myself included. So, um, so that's kind of really where some of that sits in the world for me. Anyway, that's what I, I personally think that because, you know, it's essentially martial arts instructors where we're in this day and age, we're offering a service and we have to cater to our students stroke clients, however you want to call them. Um, but the end of the day is, you know, the person that signed the check is the person that gets to choose. And so there has to be that balance between, if you like, authentic and real training um, weighed up against what an individual is actually willing to go through. So to put, again, to put that into perspective, I, I used to live in a very, very rough part of an inner city, um, very working class, a lot of high crime, a lot of drugs. Uh, and there was a very good chance that if you wander down the street, there would be an issue. Um, and that's how I lived my life for a lot of years in that environment. And, and I run a school over there where where it was very much like that with the training, very rough and ready, because that's what people needed. And that's the life that people had. Whereas now I live in a lovely little market town, as I've already mentioned in Wales, it's very laid back. There's very, very low crime. And the essence of why people train is different for the most part. Now it's more of a hobby. It's more of a lifestyle choice. Um, they want a bit of fitness. They want a bit of friendship. They want that community. And so they don't actually want the, the higher end skills that come through the more difficult training. So it's, um, so yeah, so it's all relative. I mean, but that's the beauty of martial arts, isn't it? There's, there's not one size fits all. It's, it's, there's something for everybody. I mean, that's what makes it great. Very, very well said. I want to go back to the, the instruction, teaching people in a non martial way, the, uh, the security stuff. Yeah. I think most of us are familiar with, you know, even if there isn't a formalized curriculum in the school that you train in, you could, you could probably jot one down. You could sit down and say, okay, we do, you know, we do this stuff and we do that stuff. And here's the rough progression. And I'm, I've never done any security training. I I put on a security t-shirt a few times in college and, and stood in front of things, but that was the extent of, of my security background. So I know negative nothing. What would we see that would be really different what would be the biggest differences we'd see in what you would teach me as a martial artist versus what you would teach me as someone learning security? Well, I suppose the easiest and quickest answer to that, especially here in the UK, is the emphasis is actually on the other person. So if we look at a, say, two-step sparring, attacker-defender situation, you know, the defender attacks and, and uh, sorry, the, the attacker attacks and the defender um, dispatches them in however many movements are pre-described. Um, but that normally ends up with the attacker being, uh, you know, being dispatched, shall we say. Um, when we're looking f- with security training, then essentially the, 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 the coin is flipped because the essence is in how to try and keep that person as safe as possible under that, those situations. So there's an emphasis on health situations. So you, when you start looking at things like uh, position asphyxiation, that kind of stuff, things that as an example of that, so judo, BJJ guys, grapplers, they work with this sort of thing all day long, every day in their training. But I used to get an awful lot of guys from that kind of background coming to the training and not understanding what that means. And so when you start looking at position asphyxiation, all that kind of things, then then you start having, a, again, there's a legal responsibility on the back of that. Uh, and all those things are related. So when it becomes a job of work, when it becomes something that you are paid to do and represent a, a company, a corporation, uh, whatever that may be, then as such, you have both legal and moral responsibilities in and around that. So the training is more about keeping the other person safe as well as being able to, you know, physically deal with the situation. Could you give us an example of what an altercation might look like with that mindset of keeping the other person safe? Yeah, again, it depends on really what you're tasked to do. So as an example, there were, uh, if I was working in a nightclub environment and my role was to deal with troublemakers and escort them out of the building, 
then uh, breaking up fights, that sort of thing, then the idea of that would be as a team. So normally there would be more than just myself. We would uh, look to separate the people fighting and then escort them from the premises in the safest way possible. Now, in the old days, that would usually involve um, a headlock or a choke of some description and just dragging them out that way. But obviously that's a, a dangerous sort of way to do things. There's no denying how effective it is, which is why people did it for so long. But it also has a danger attached to it. So nowadays we learn restraints, we learn controls, we learn things that are, that are less likely to cause long-term injury. So that's a, that's a very sort of a, a quick way of looking at that. What might you substitute for that, that headlock or chokehold? Well, we're talking uh, about you know wrist uh, manipulation or again if I'm going to be utterly honest, which I like yeah. to do, I appreciate um, that. <laughs> then <laughs> the, the, the truth is there's really not that much to um, you know to take over from it because if I'm being absolutely honest, if you've got a 19, 20 year old, a 20 stone guy that's you know full of cocaine or meth or whatever the heck it is that's absolutely raging, there's really only two things you can do at that point if he doesn't want to be compliant. So you either knock him out or choke him out. That's the reality of it. Otherwise, he's going to hurt you and the people around you. And the thing is, if you're trained to a standard, this is my personal belief, if you're trained and you know what you're doing, you can safely bring that person to a point of, of just before they lose consciousness fully, where they become compliant and you can actually then deal with them in a safer manner if i have to strike somebody especially somebody that size i've got to use an awful lot of impact and there's a very real risk of very serious injury both to myself and them so if you think about me punching somebody um along the jawline to actually create a you know enough enough of a concussive blow to knock somebody out then there's a good chance i'm going to break my hand i'm going to break their jaw there's going to be teeth missing um you know that's that's a lot of damage so I actually think the truth of the matter is it's there really isn't anything that's going to replace a choke when it comes to actual usability, but there are things that we can do, especially if there's more than one of us um, that, that, that are a bit safer and kinder. But unfortunately, almost all physical intervention techniques that are, that are trained like this through corporations and companies, almost all of them stop at a point where they are not actually that effective against a much larger non-compliant opponent. Um, and that's obviously where we see a lot of these problems in the news these days. We're going to nod to those and, and not unpack them because we, one, don't have the time and two, ugh, I, I just don't want to go there. Painful no, I stuff. think, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that the truth of that is there, there's, there's, it's far too big a conversation for us to have in the time frame that we have. And also I don't have enough knowledge of all of these situations to actually give any input of any, real oh. worth so um <laughs> imagine that someone who's willing to withhold their opinion because they don't have all the the information <laughs> it's like a revolutionary concept in 2020 <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Mo moving moving on moving on we may have just defended some people and uh, i'm okay with that moving on so i suspect we've come pretty close to modern era to, to the now with what your training and your focus looks like. Am I, am I right? Um, yeah. Well, this is what you're so, doing now. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I basically, um, I mean, what, what, what went on from that was I started to look into other things outside of martial arts, but using, if you like the techniques of martial arts. So um, I started writing and, I, I, I half wrote a book that I told myself was no good for a few years and then went back and finished it and it became an Amazon bestseller and was very widely uh, well received. And so then I've written a number, a number of others. So I've got, uh, I've done some online courses. I started, I started moving into a, a wider world, if you like, with that. Um, and so I now do sort of several things on a, on a grander scale, including helping others to, you know, progress whatever it is there they wish to do with their life using the tenets of martial arts, if you like, which, which as we know, um, it's the life skills that, that get taught within martial arts are uh, very far reaching and expand well, well beyond what we do in a gi in a sports hall. If you could take what you understand now, what you know now, 
of your training. And you could go back and, and talk to younger you, you know, at any point, whether that's judo, boxing, karate, somewhere along this path. And you had a chance to train with younger you for, let's say, an hour. What stuff would you work with yourself on? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question, to be honest. Um, if I only had an hour, that's actually a really tough one because there's not a huge amount with regards to physical technique or anything that you could teach in an hour. I think I'd probably, I'd probably be more inclined to talk about sort of mindset and goal setting and all those kind of things because um, one of the things that I do regret, which is odd because for a very long time in my life, this was all I ever did. I mean, literally every waking hour I wasn't at work, I was training or reading about training or doing things to do with training. Um, it was, it was all consuming, but I would actually tell myself to, to train more. <laughs> um, there's, as I, as I approach 50 now in the next few months, my body just obviously can't tolerate what it could at 25. And so there are so many things I would have liked to have explored more. There just wasn't enough hours in the, in the day or time in the world, you know? Um, so yeah, I think I would tell myself to travel more, train more, try new things more. <laughs> mm. I suspect the try new things more is, is probably the heart of it. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, you started out and, and I wonder, I wonder if your concept of martial arts, you mentioned Bruce Lee and, and, it doesn't take much time with Bruce Lee's films or books or anything to see the variety, to see the, the, the scope of what he incorporated in his choreography. I wonder if that left a mark that, you know, it took however many years for you to realize that you needed that variety as well to be happy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although I would say that with a very, a very strong caveat, which is uh, I firmly believe that, there needs to be a foundation art. So again, some people may disagree with this, but I, I honestly believe that somebody should spend a long time in one particular art, master that to a level of, of, of good competency before then moving into other things. A, because it will make the other things much easier to understand because we only work in certain ways and the mechanics of that translate whatever style, you know. So, um, so the fundamentals remain the same and you can spot that as well, which is really, really interesting because you can have a system from China, a system from uh, Indonesia, a system from England, whatever. But the, the, the core fundamentals, if they're good, they will apply across the board. So you can see all of that. Mm. Um, it also gives you the discipline, so on and so forth. So I would say absolutely explore more, try more, but on the understanding that you have a core art that is where your feet are firmly planted for those foundations. Um, and one of the things that I think is missing a lot in modern day training, and again, other people might see this differently, is that there's an awful lot of people just flitting from one thing to another and not really getting a deep understanding of any of it. I've observed through, through travels and, and training in, in a number of schools that no matter where you start, if you get that, those fundamentals, that foundational training of a while, and, and how long that is, is entirely subjective. But that seems to become the root language. It's the way you express your body from which everything else relates. Meaning, you know, I started with karate. I train in Taekwondo now but I'm still a karate guy doing Taekwondo. And anybody who spends time watching me knows this guy didn't start with Taekwondo. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting, isn't it? They get sort of, it gets, you get, you get sort of that set into, but the mechanic, uh, the mechanics and the movement, the, the body movement, that all remains the same in the sense that we've only got two arms and two legs each. Well, for the most part, and, and we only move in certain ways. So the, the truth of how we move as human beings is fundamental regardless of style it's the the style is just the way that's interpreted in the same way that um you know language has a different sound but fundamentally it's built it's built in the same way so one of the things that, that used to really interest me was one of my uh, one of my instructors an absolutely wonderful man called dave turton who's 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 had a very long long history in the martial arts in the uk um one of the guys that made a massive impact on my particular journey. Um, and he would say that he didn't need a 10 hour grading for somebody. He could literally tell within a few minutes 
um, you know, where they where their sort of level of knowledge was by the way that they moved. And and I and I do you know what? It's one of those where I I always respected that as a level of knowledge that 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 I could only sort of aspire to. And uh, I'm still far from there yet, but he was adamant that, you know, he could tell within a few minutes by the way somebody moved. And do you know what, that um, I see more and more of that now as I get older myself and I understand a little bit more about the world. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that somebody with a good foundation in one art, I think will have a much, much easier time understanding other arts because the fundamentals remain the same. I wholeheartedly agree. You mentioned a book. Or maybe it was books. Let's let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, I've got a I've got a number of books out. So um, the first one was uh, was it's called Modern Samurai, which basically is uh, is not the fact that I think I'm a feudal medieval warrior from the from the Far East, um, but it's basically it's based on my journey through the security industry and how will that look. So that was that was my first one. That became an Amazon bestseller, which I'm grateful to say and that did really well so that prompted me to write some more so then I wrote uh, my journey up the mountain which was that was more about my martial arts kind of stuff but again uh, a memoirs kind of thing with lots of uh, lots of stories in there lots of interesting sort of tales of uh, a bit like today really lots of sort of sort of ramblings off in different kind of directions but all built around my, my journey itself so then I did a uh, more teaching one called um, Child Safe which is one of the series around children's self-protection that sort of thing and I've just recently released one a few months ago with a co-author called Kai Morgan which is uh, which was called Online Martial Arts Evolution or Extinction which is very relevant in the current situation we released the book uh, we wrote it and released it just before the, the situation panned out the way that it did um, but it's incredibly relative, you know, relevant for now. Can, can you give us a bit of the premise in, in that? Obviously, I don't want you to ruin the book, but... Yeah, yeah. It's, get get it's, us excited it's, about the book. <laughs> well, essentially, I started recording online courses and teaching through uh, the medium of the screen a number of years ago, and it was just a, an add-on to what I was already doing and just another way to reach the world. Um, and so it, it was it was it was useful like that. But then obviously the question then is as we all move move forward with technologies, how is that going to impact training itself? How is that going to impact our art? So as an example of that, if you look at um, MMA, MMA is basically built around what the television audience wants and can see. Mm. And so the whole rule base, the whole sport art of MMA is based around that. If you look at, say, variations of Taekwondo, as an example, and you look at Olympic Taekwondo and the various elements of that, and then you look at, well, what's the style represent now? Well, it represents a, a rule-based system that is designed for the audience to enjoy. So you could say that that's been you know, manipulated through the years to suit that. So there's lots of different factors. And now what we're seeing is, is people changing their syllabuses, people changing the way they grade to fit to fit the, the situation at the moment because it's, it's necessary because we all want to survive. We all want our art to survive. We all want to, you know, come out of this at the other end and still be able to train, teach and everything else. Um, but to do that, we've got to, we've, we've got to literally squeeze whatever it is we do into a shape that, that, that fits the situation of the moment. That may not be what it looked like before. So as an example of that in the UK at the moment, we're not allowed to key eye. Um, and if for anybody that's ever done any kind of traditional system, then they will understand the ramifications of that and what that means. And, and the fact that, you know, historically it's been something where a lot of attention has been given to, you know, correct breathing and all the rest of it. And now all of a sudden we have to take that out of the equation entirely. And we're in a world where now we can't, not only can we not teach it, we have to penalize anybody that tries to do it. Um, so, so basically, yeah, it's an exploration of, of how that may look moving forward. So, 
it's yeah, it's an interesting book. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed writing it, and, and Kai Morgan, my co-author, she's uh, she's an academic as well, and and has an awful lot to do with the science, the educational side of it, and and has a very deep understanding from that point of view. So so it was a, it was a really good exploration in the subject. What if people want to find those books? Are they all on Amazon? Just search for yeah, name. just yeah, go straight to Amazon, and uh, you'll find them all there. Okay, great. And and what else? What what else do you have going on that's consuming your time, martial arts wise? Well, at the moment, my physical gym remains shut due to the uh, the current situation. So I'm uh, I'm working in the background to try and uh, get get ready to reopen that and get that sorted out. Um, I do I, I work with other instructors, um, helping them to grow and to. Uh, to improve their business or that sort of thing. And and one of the things that I've managed to do recently, which may or may, may or may not interest people, depending on the point of view, is I found myself TikTok famous. <laughs> We've got a link to your account then. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you send us the link? I don't remember that in the form. Uh, I think I may have done. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm there as basically modern samurai MA for anyone that wants to have a look. I have a following of over a quarter of a million people. I get regular <laughs> views of about 2 million a week and I gain at around a thousand followers per day. So, um, so yeah, I've kind of taken off on that platform a little bit, which is, which is great fun because I, I know that obviously it's in the news a lot at the moment where yes. you guys are. Yes. Um, and that's a that's a that's an interesting conversation in itself when you start looking at it as to how much is political. But there you go. Um, but the point is, the platform itself, uh, regardless of whatever issues being discussed, it's actually at its core, it's actually a lot of fun to be part of and to do, which is, I suppose, the attraction for a lot of people. So, so what I've what I've had to do is is an interesting skill, which is basically learn to condense my teachings into. 15 second segments um which is actually quite a challenging thing but great fun but when we're done i'm gonna add you to my tiktok account start following you to go along with the multitude of dog accounts that's that's primarily what what i've got going on with tiktok and i i don't think i've ever posted i just the end of the day or middle of a bad day I'll, i'll sit down and just look at all the ridiculous dogs doing ridiculous <laughs> dog things and it cheers me up i mean how can how can you not it's a it is a fun platform for sure now other than oh god sorry other than tiktok and amazon books you know where where would we find you online all the usual suspects so you can find me on facebook linkedin instagram twitter all those sorts of things so um matt state s-t-a-i-t that's that's the way to find me on those or you can just look at um anything really under the modern samurai banner because again that's the name of my gym that's the name of my book that's the name of uh one of my businesses so you should also be able to find me that way is there a fun story for that name that's a that's a great name it makes me think maybe you watched the last samurai and you wholly rejected tom cruise as the last samurai and said no we'll keep it going Oh, well, no, I actually, I actually named my gym because I've had my gym for a, uh, for a good few years now. So oh. it was actually long before that, that movie uh, came out. So, right um, no, I, I, again, like a lot of people, when they're trying to figure out a name for something, I, I threw a few things around and um, played with concepts and ideas. And at the time, as I was doing the security and training in various elements, the I love the idea of the samurai. Again, that's that's me being the hero in my journey, as we talked about earlier, the romanticized version of that. I mean, the truth is I probably would make a terrible samurai, being absolutely honest. Um, however, the version, the romanticized version of it, I really like the idea of the ethos of it, the the perceived values that the samurai had, uh, all of those things lent really well to you know to, to my sort of way of thinking. And then when I actually looked at if samurai existed in the world today, you know, how would they approach their training? Because they were, um, they were more than just warriors. And so it was very much a case of, well, um, if I pull that into the modern day, then that's kind of what I'm trying to achieve. Although be it badly, you know, I, I like to write, I like to, I like art, I like to draw, I draw extensively. I like to, I like to make music. So I, it's more than just punching people in the face. Um, and so, so the modern samurai just sort of, it seemed to work for me. This has been fun. This has been really good stuff and we'll have to have you back, but it's time to end this one. 
So we always ask the guests, you know, how do you want to close out your episode? What, what final thoughts do you have for the people listening? I would say keep training, enjoy it, make the most of it, because one day when you're old and fat like me, you'll look back on it and, uh, and wish you'd done more. <laughs> like I said in the intro, good stuff, different stuff, and perspective that I think is pretty darn useful, stuff that I think we can all spend some more time contemplating as not just martial artists, but as people. So thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show. And I hope we talk again. If you want to go a little bit deeper on what we've talked about or today's guest, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You'll find links and all kinds of other stuff for this and every other episode. Eventually, we end up with transcripts for each episode. Those don't happen at the time of release, but they do happen. And we've been going back and transcribing all of the old episodes too. So if you know someone who maybe prefers to read versus listen, that's an option. Check it out, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you're up for supporting us in the work that we do, you have lots of options. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code. Podcast15 is going to get you 15% off. Or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help with our Patreon account. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out in the world wearing something with whistlekick, maybe a shirt or a hat, say hello. Find out, do they listen to the show? How did they find whistlekick? And if you've got guest suggestions, I want to hear them. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.